Um, I'm Carolina. I'm the community director at the Interfaith Encounter Association. Uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and a lot of people I have no, I have never seen before. So I'm very glad you are all here. Um, so first of all, I'll uh, invite you the Stolov, who is the executive director of the Interfaith Encounter Association, uh, to speak a few words, and then I'm going to explain a little bit like what we're going to do. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the unusual Interface Encounter Day of 2020, uh, which I think no, is not only a bad thing. Uh, we always, every year we gather together um, with uh, mostly people from uh, different groups because uh, people usually meet the 10 or 20 or 30 people in their group, but in this day, they have the chance to meet people from other groups, uh, learn about how the group, how other groups are working, uh, what types of conversations they have, what types of other activities they have. So that's very enriching, very supporting. We also it also allows for other partners to join, uh, financial partners, activity partners, uh, different type of partners to to come and see and and meet the. The, the people who actually come to the conversations. And uh, it also allows people who have never met the uh, IEA before to, to get uh, the chance to, to be introduced to the, to the organization, to the people. And this year we are, uh, we are forced to do it by Zoom, which on the one hand uh, <coughs> limits participation of many of our people who are who don't have the technology or have other limitations that they cannot join. But on the other hand, it allows many people from all parts of the world to join. And it will also give us the special privilege to hear uh, Doc Dr. Ahmed Shahid later on, who is the, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, uh, an amazing person that I think it will be uh, wonderful for everyone to hear. Um, the way we will do it is that uh, Carolina ex will explain in a minute, we will break into uh, uh, what is called in Zoom a room, but in uh, rooms, but uh, we always do it. We always break into small circles so people have the chance to uh, meet in depth a small group of people rather than just hear the names of everyone. Uh, then we will gather together and uh, because Dr. Shahid uh, is now busy in another, another meeting, instead of giving his uh, greetings and his um, intervention in the beginning, he will do it as a concluding, uh, in his concluding words. So I think uh, it's now best, maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe there are people here who know nothing about IEA. So I would say in one sentence that what we do is build bridges between communities, mostly in the Holy Land, but we also have here some uh, uh, representatives of groups outside the Holy Land. We have three in, in North America and one in Kenya. Uh, the groups meet together uh, typically once a month over, over time. It's not limited in time. And they build bridges between neighboring communities uh, as uh, growing islands of uh, relations of, uh, of peace and, and mutual care and mutual respect. So I hand over to Carolina who will explain now how the group, the, the small groups will work. And I hope you all enjoy the evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yuda. So as Yuda said, you are going to be assigned to different groups. Um, I try to separate you in advance so it, each group could have at least some balance of different religions, but we can always be sure about who is actually going to come from the people who register. So I hope it will still work out. Um, and so each of the groups has someone responsible from the IA who's going to help you facilitate the conversation. Basically, we're going to have um, going through uh, some introdu introduction before. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, uh, to taste a little bit of what it is an interfaith dialogue uh, with IEA, with a little bit of text, a little bit of stories from you, from experiences you can all share uh, from your personal and religious points of view. 
Um, and we we only we don't have that much time, and also Zoom does not allow us to stay here for that long and to actually concentrate. So we'll be for around half an hour in these rooms, and then we are going to come back to these room to this uh, plenum where we're going to hear um, uh, the words of our guest speaker. Too short. Okay, <laughs> it will always be too short. You need to come to the next encounters of the IEA so we can continue the conversation. Um, so uh, welcome back everyone. Um, so I hope you enjoyed your rooms. I understand that in some groups you had two religions, some groups you had three. We didn't have exactly the same number for participants from each religion, unfortunately. But I hope that in any case, the exchange was um, significant and interesting. Um, if you want to have other meaningful exchanges in the future, um, we will have, we'll be very happy to help you with us again. And before I go to our next, uh, to our guest speaker, I, I will put on the chat, it's a form that you can fill with um, whatever you're interested in, where you're coming from, uh, what languages you would like to have an encounter, and uh, we'll get back to you um, as soon as we can. Um, so basically, if you want to join groups, if you want to join other encounters, you can just fill this form and then we'll be in touch with you. Uh, also like to thank our coordinators who uh, facilitated the, the dialogue today. Uh, they were so, so important for things to work. Um, so for all the co our coordinators who agreed to, to help us today, um, Bruce and Mark and Yossi and Bob and Yafashira and Sariana, thank you so much. So um, uh, Yehuda will introduce our guest speaker. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, my good friend and colleague and uh, actually a good friend of the Interfaith Encounter Association, Doc Dr. Ahmed Shahid, who is a real inspiration. He's the UN Special Rep uh, Rapporteur for, free, for free, Freedom of Religion and Belief and, um, and also has many, many other, uh, other uh, distinctions. Uh, but uh, I will let him uh, speak and you will see what I mean. So Ahmed, very, very grateful for you to, to join us and please, uh, please, uh, the, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, um, Yehuda. Um, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. First of all, my apologies for not being able to join you earlier in the day for the full length of the meeting. Um, as you heard, um, I am the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And I've been doing this work for four years for the UN and I've got two more years to run. And I'm really pleased to see all of you, uh, you know, from around uh, different uh, faith-based communities and from around the world actually, uh, come together for this important discussion. As you well know in, from, your, from your part of the world, that we're living in a time when there is you know, a rise in intolerance around the world. Um, and there's a need uh, to, ad to address that, that intolerance through engagement across different faith divides, across different nationalities, across, across different divides, uh, so that we have a better understanding of, of, of each other. My work for the UN involves uh, undertaking country visits, so visiting countries to see what's happening on different contexts, and then look at good practice and challenges and report back to the council. I also uh, advocate on behalf of individuals who are facing violations. Um, I also produce thematic reports, and most of my thematic reports have covered issues of intolerance. My last report to the Council this year looked at gender equality and religion, an issue of concern in many parts of the world. And last year, in September, this time last year, my report focused on anti Semitism uh, and um, human rights issues. In other words, how can we use a human rights framework to address the growing incidence of anti-Semitic hatred and anti-Semitic violence? And of course, before that, I looked at general issues of intolerance. My next report to the council in March, and I had consultations today, which delayed my arrival here today, is on anti-Muslim hatred, looking at how in these contexts, including intra-Muslim hatred, affects the 
uh, you know, ability of different individuals to practice their faith and live, live peacefully. Now, um, I've been working with Yehuda in, in the UN context and across a range of years now to look at how people of different faiths and all faiths and none actually can come together and develop a common understanding, find a common ground where all of us can work together to promote everybody's individual rights, focus on the notion of individual human dig dignity. I've been also working with uh, Yehuda on a different project uh, with other governments, looking at how, again, faith-based communities can promote human rights in a variety of uh, contexts. I've been also working with him and others in UNESCO, looking at how the idea of tolerance, understanding, and education can be very helpful. And it is at this point I want to highlight that next week uh, we'll mark the 25th anniversary of the UN's International Day of Tolerance, um, a day marked every year to promote tolerance around the world on the understanding that by tolerance we mean accepting everybody in our rich diversity, not just tolerating something that we find of offensive. No, it means accepting everybody in our diverse in our diversity different ways of being. So we regard everybody as an equal, equal person. In my travels, I found that important initiatives, bridge building, even by two people can be very, very important. I came across a striking example in the Netherlands uh, where uh, a rabbi and an imam, they call themselves the Mo and Mu initiative, uh, Muhammad and Moshe uh, initiative, uh, their first names. Well, you know, they formed a friendship and they were showing different communities that Muslims and Jews in Netherlands got along very well. That the fact that they came from different faith traditions and different ethnic backgrounds didn't matter, that they, they could find common ground. And because they worked together, they were very good at dispelling stereotypes, myths, and, and negative profiling as it were. So for young people, it was very, very informative, very important, people of different faiths can work together, live together, and, and be very peaceful. So these individual initiatives between two peoples can be very, very helpful. More broadly, uh, I think uh, interfaith encounters work because very often what we do not know is something we fear more than what we do know. So when people do not communicate, when people don't work together, we, we, have, we have fear uh, between them. In Sri Lanka, a country where there is a lot of intolerance and hatred across communities, they are learning that one of the problems they have faced is that they haven't given enough opportunity uh, for people to work together. So in their schooling system until now, a Buddhist student will go to a Buddhist school for the 18 years of their, until the 18 years of age and they finish schooling. Um, the Muslim student will go to the Muslim education system, the mother side and so on and so forth until they also reach 18 years of age and so on and so forth. So young people didn't really get a chance to live together, work together, talk to each other really, until they met a workplace. But then it was too late for, the, to, for, for their stereotypes. So now they're thinking of mixing schools together, schools together. So people learn at a very young age that there are differences and different ways of being, and they're all, all fine. So I think interfaith encounters amongst people of faith, amongst human rights defenders, amongst parliamentarians, amongst students, amongst people of all walks of life is vitally important to to dissolve stereotypes, to build friendships, and to really build societal resilience to make sure that we all live in a world where everybody um, uh, is safe, everybody is able to live in peace, and that recognize that none of us is really safe until all of us are safe. I also want to highlight the important commitment, that the important contribution that faith-based persons, people of faith can make, not just our own communities, but across communities, because as Yahuda and I and, and when we brought everybody else to the room, uh, you know, had agreed that across all traditions, there's one common theme of not treating others in a way we wouldn't want them to treat us. So in other words, treat others as you would have them treat us. That, that common, that golden rule is common to nearly all the world's major religions. So on this basis, I think interfaith encounters have proved to be very, very uh, useful. And I commend you for your tireless work. I commend the Interfaith and Association for, for their ex excellent work. And I'm really pleased that I had a chance to uh, talk to you. I'd be very pleased too, if Yahuda has time uh, to respond to any questions that, that you may have uh, for me this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ahmed. I think uh, maybe 
after we close, maybe we'll allow people to stay and ask you questions because we are here for a, a little bit more than an hour and we committed. But if people want to stay and have a conversation with you, I think it's a great opportunity. So we will wrap up the, the official session and uh, stay unofficially with you. So thank you very, very much for everyone who joined. And yeah. so next year in Jerusalem. Uh, hopefully in person. So thank you everyone who came. Uh, we, as I said, I left in the chat um, a form so if you want to join groups in the future and we're staying here. Whoever wants to stay with Dr. Ahmed Chaid will, will be able to answer some of your questions. Thank you, Yehuda. Thank you, everyone. Thank See you, you again. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye, Bruce. Hello. Bye -bye. Hello, Brother Bye. Ahmed. I have a question. Hello. Okay. Ahmed, yes. I have a question. Nassim. Nassim Malik from Sweden. Uh, the thing is, uh, what is very alarming, and I want to bring it to your notice that I just had in my group also, this, that uh, nowadays what we are experiencing that uh, the educated people, they are becoming more and more extremists, you know. So this is something very new, which was not before. As educated people, they are becoming more extremists, you know. Um, well, well, I think, you know, uh, Nassim, good to see you here. Um, I think, you know, what is to be educated? It's an important question to be asked. I think if we measure a university degree as a yardstick of education, that often doesn't serve out to be the best way to, ju to judge that. But education is, I think, able to think critically, um, be able to, you know, use one's mind and be open and, and to be aware that what one does not know is a lot more than what one might know. That the more we learn the more we find out the, the, the less we know about anything so i think to be truly educated is not to look at a piece of paper saying you have this or that degree in that context you're right uh there is if you like um, you know uh more intolerance even in these quarters and you can find some root causes for this and if you look at root cause of intolerance these are typically based on again um, fear of the unknown uh, fear of the other usually the the, the immigrant xenophobia is a large pa part of this and we've seen a rise in that due to two other trends. One is the online dimension, where people are able to take leave of their identity. So once you go online anonymously, you somehow believe that you're no longer, you know, being seen by anybody. And then you have this license to be something you might not otherwise be. So those inhibitions go away. That, that's one. The other, of course, uh, is that I think we see around the world, um, uh, I think, you know, um, issues of misgovernance, issues of, of inequality and misgovernance. And, and these issues pile up into blaming against somebody else. So whether one is educated or not, I think the question is that these developments, the online anonymity and the offline inequality are, you know, playing into this. So if you have a young person coming out of a, a degree from a university and find no job, uh, it's quite easy to pursue that person, that job has been taken up by somebody who's an immigrant. So, you know, these sorts of discourses uh, create, um, I think, more hatred. I agree with Thank Nisim. You very much, sir. Thank you very much. I, I agree with Nisim and uh, in my own circle of acquaintances, uh, I'm the only one that is interested in any kind of interfaith organizations or anything. And all of my friends are extreme uh, right wing and um, uh, not militant, but certainly um, supportive of Trump, for instance, and um, all of that kind of stuff, and uh, of our own prime minister, which many of the people in our country are opposed to. And um, it's, it's disturbing, and it's also, it makes you very lonely, very lonely. So, I just am going to reflect, I've joined something called Better Angels in the United States, which brings these people together in a formal dialogue, which I think is really interesting and probably positive that we know one another's hearts rather than one another's hates. 
I think there are a number of, if you like, you know, initiatives around the world of individuals working in, in, in the space. But at the same time, I also agree that, you know, we also have a large number of people who think that faith-based actors are a problem, that religion in many quarters, um, you know, is getting a bad name as it were. And it can be in part due to secularization, I suppose, it can also be in part due to perhaps, you know, more reporting on religion-based violence or other aspects of people falling off religion. Or in some cases, there can be attempts by um, faith-based groups, as it were, religious act actors, uh, coming more, more visibly into the public space, occupying sort of more space, creating therefore a backlash. So there are a number of reasons I think this happens. Um, but just as there are people who are sort of, you know, peddling hatred, there are also groups that are rallying together uh, to, to, to create spaces, safe spaces, or engagement and dialogue. Uh, uh, Dr. Shahid, this is Zulfika from uh, Bangalore, uh, India. Um, I, I worked for International Association for Religious Freedom for a number of years and used to be the coordinator for South Asia. And um, I know over the past 20, 25 years, um, a lot of changes have happened uh, uh, within India politically. And um, I'm sure uh, you would be busy uh, reporting a lot of developments from here to, to the organization that you are reporting to. But now I find in India, even to talk about interfaith understanding cooperation uh, is, uh, is a challenge uh, because uh, the, the present political dispensation uh, is, uh, is, is saying we can, we can very well do without minorities. We are happy to have the majority is with us and minorities you can live as uh, second class citizens if you want to now uh, but uh, this is the larger picture and now the interactions that we have are uh, mostly uh, at community level one on one or with friends with like minded people but how how do we at, look at the larger big picture um, at the governmental level and how how what kind of interventions internationally you can suggest to, to, to make sure that the, the right to freedom of religion and belief, discrimination, the hatred that is being spread is, is regulated to some extent. Yeah, um, if, if I may. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, India is a country of, I think, increasing concern uh, to, to everyone. If you look at the last report of the US Commission for Religious Freedom, USERF, which came out in April this year, for the first time in their, you know, 20 year history, uh, they had listed India as a country of particular concern, reflecting, uh, you know, the, um, the fallout from the CAA, the, the act that gave citizenship to neighboring people from neighboring countries, unless they were, uh, I think, Muslim. Um, and of course, what the government of uh, Prime Minister Modi has been doing with regard to Hindu Tuva, the spread of right-wing Hindu ide ideology, um, and of course attacks on Christians and Muslims and others uh, in India. So there is a growing uh, concern there. And of course, India is a secular state and still has a very robust civil society and has still have, you know, good institutions like a judiciary that, 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 that works well for the, for the, for the you know, large part. Um, but I think there's a need to mobilize more, if you like, within India against such hatred there's also a need to look at more sharply from outside into India. Although I realize Amnesty International has just been forced to close the offices in India recently. So that space is narrowing. And I think um, um, what is going here is that India really cares what is said about India because they, they, they react very sharply to any criticism. It's usually a good sign because that means that government will, you know, um, is, is concerned about this. But that doesn't mean that people get any better in the short, short run. So I, the way I've been pursuing is trying to mobilize Indian society to document rights violations, talk about them in, in my reports, talk about them in various for, of, forums, and also find ways in which governments that can talk to Indians keep talking. So US has been pretty close to India in the past few years. And um, Ambassador Brownback has been to India. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he met Dalai Lama on his visit there, but people at that level can engage with government of India and look at ways in which people outside the country are concerned and have the concerns communicate to them. And um, the way things are going in India with hate speech, online in particular, I'm very concerned 
um, that there are, if you like, no stops the way things are going at the moment. Thank you, thank you. Sure, Shahid, um, if I can ask if there's any work that you can maybe point us to or tell us about that is being done at a global level to address this huge swing to the right with regards to Islamic states becoming much more Wahhabi and fundamental in their interpretation of Islam. I'm originally Somali and, you know, in the 60s, our women, you know, didn't have to cover, they had their hair out, they'd wear, they'd dress like Europeans or dress like traditional Somalis in their once leave off outfits. And we were still 100% Muslim. You know, the culture and the faith were two different things. You can have your culture, um, but faith was never doubted, you know? Uh, um, so, and this is true of Iran, Pakistan, Egypt, Afghanistan. If you can just talk a little bit about that, please. Right. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, the trend of Islamization um, is something that's been written about for a long time now. Uh, I think the literature on this begins uh, from around um, 1980 onwards. Um, some of the databases on religion also cover this. And uh, uh, Jonathan Fox uh, at Hebrew University maintains, has been maintaining um, world, you know, world data on this freedom going back, I think, to, from 1970s onwards. And he tracks how religion has become um, so salient in everything, including how the Middle East conflict itself had become, if you like, you know, uh, overlaid by Isla Islamism uh, over time. Um, so that is one trend. Of course, Iran's own history shows this, uh, going from under Shah, of course, repressive, but a secular state to becoming a fascist state almost uh, under, 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 the, under Khomeini and his, and his successors. Pakistan, lot, lot written about Islamization from the 80s onwards under, under the military government of, uh, of uh, General Zia. You have um, specifically um, women writing about this. So there's a group called Musawa, that is a network of, cis, um, of Muslim feminists, as, as it were, from around the world. People like Asma, Jahang, uh, uh, um, Asma Jahangir, people like um, uh, Iranians like uh, Zaina Mir Husseini, American uh, scholars like Amin Abadud, they are all part of this network. And they are not only tracking what's happening uh, to Muslim women in these Islamized countries, but also ways to, ways to push them back. Sudan used to be a leader in this field in terms of pushing forward the Islamization agenda. Now, of course, now there's, there's a potential that Sudan could reverse uh, it, 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 its way back. So a lot of literature on Islamization exists, um, as does, of course, issues of radicalization, uh, how that is happening as well. So, so I can't point me to literature on this, except Musawa, books by Musawa, uh, would track how women have been affected by this trend because women have been the most affected by, by, by this trend in Muslim countries. Anyone else has a question? Okay, then it's, it's not a question, but it is a comment uh, that uh, over the past. Uh, a few weeks we've been having these uh, uh, new peace efforts uh, in our region between Israel and the um, and the Trucial states, and uh, it's very encouraging. And everybody seems to be excited on both sides, and uh, it's certainly going to be interesting how it's going to play out. And um, everybody's very optimistic. Um just to comment on that, I come from a country called the Maldives, uh, where I work as a diplomat. And um, when in my time in the foreign office, I tried to restore ties with Israel because we always had ties with Israel. Israel was the very first country to send an ambassador to the Maldives and became independent in 1965. And, I, and we had an ambassador to the Maldives and he, he was withdrawn when, when, of course, the Arab states and the UN uh, began an assault on, on, on Israel in 75 onwards. But I was always insistent that we never formally uh, sever ties with Israel. So in my time in the foreign ministry is about 10 years back. We restored uh, Israel, Israel we, uh, began programs of collaboration, including programs to exchange tourism, medical, you know, health tourism, health exchange, and agriculture as well. So I think there is potential to show that collaboration with Israel cooperation 
is useful to all parties involved here. And that, my point has always been, if you have a disagreement in the country, it's best to talk to them rather than shout, shout from, the, from the fringes. So I think uh, the, the possibility is open now in the Gulf region, the crucial states of dialogue with Israel and of peace and, and making sure that they are normalized is a very positive trend. And this can contribute more positively to the overall issues that they're grappling with than you know, the polarized um, antagonistic approach they've been pursuing previously. So I'm fully in favor of the efforts to restore ties and normalize relations amongst all states there. Yes, I have a question, if I may, uh, sir. About a month ago, there was the um, G20 Interface Forum um, that um, was co-organized, I think, by some agencies at the UN again. And on one hand side, it's very encouraging to see how many faith-based actors and organizations there are that work together towards the implementation of the UN goals. And I would just like to ask you how you see the importance of that kind of um, uh, interface forum, the G20, and if you were involved yourself in some way. Uh, yes, I attended uh, the G20 Interfaith Forum uh, last year. I couldn't go this year due to other commitments. And um, it's, I think, important. My last report to the UN just this October was on the SDGs, uh, Development Agenda, and religious freedom, how the two need to be co combined. I was arguing that you can't achieve the SDGs or the or development goals unless governments also respected everybody's right to be who they are in the way they wanted. Mm -hmm. And we often find faith-based communities are those most left behind deliberately by governments who suppress rights of this community. So say in Pakistan, the Ahmadi community is suppressed deliberately by the government and all their rights, education, the right to life to begin with, but education, health, housing, all of that uh, are, 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 are rejected. Likewise, other minorities in, in, in other contexts as well. So it's important that faith-based actors who have a long, if you like, long spell working on humanitarian aspects become part of the UN's work in this. There's been an interfaith um, task force at UNFPA for, for a long time, and its director, its long-term long -term director, uh, Azhar Karam, has now moved on to a global um, group called the uh, Religions for Peace. It's been yes. uh, uh, for about 50 years now, I think. Mm -hmm. She is this new head. And I think through her, there are links being built back to the UN on how faith-based actors can collaborate with that. So I think the interfaith version of G20 is important, not only because faith is so important to ev for, for everybody, but also because faith-based actors have had a long, so like long time doing education, doing healthcare, doing other activities on the ground. And they have so much expertise that can be used by you and other relevant actors uh, when they want to have their um, like work uh, taken forward as well. Mm -hmm. And so you see some openness on the side of the governance to accept some of those proposals and so on from your experience? I think uh, the, the collaboration between governments and faith-based groups is increasing. Okay. There, is, there used to be a huge reluctance and still there is in some quarters that if you bring faith-based actors into a development field, it will not be inclusive. But I think now people are finding that faith-based actors are essential to breaking down some barriers, to making sure some policies are taken forward and they have been showing they can work, they can work together. So I think that collaborative spirit that has been shown by faith-based actors uh, is enabling them to have a longer, if you like, reach uh, with governments on how they can work. Now, that, that said, some governments are problematic. So in Pakistan, you would find a lot of challenges for some groups to work. Uh, same with Sri Lanka, same with India, same with, you know, um, Saudi Arabia for, the, for, that, for that matter, where, where the country is repressive in terms of its faith-based, you know, uh, commitments, then that space is, is more limited. But where there is space, then there is a greater willingness to engage with faith-based actors uh, in developing work. Well, Saudi Arabia hosted it, so that's interesting. <laughs> well, you know, countries can host forums. Uh, they can host, they, are, they can do good diplomacy, but mm -hmm. poor substance. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, have the, um, you have the UAE, the, you know, the Abu Dhabi uh, um, hosted a meeting between his, the Pope and the Azhar Imam, I think last year, February. Now, of course, Saudi Arabia has a long way to go with regard to respecting uh, religious freedom there. So yes. 
countries can host meetings, but it's something else all to act upon the findings of those meetings. Sure. Thank if, you, sir. If time allows, I have just one question. Can I ask? Yeah, one last question and then we'll... Okay. We'll close uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shaheed, uh, we have a little problem in Scandinavia, and especially that deals with the, not only Islamophobia, that burning of Quran and defaming Prophet Muhammad and what has happened due to this, you know, the Muslim youth, young boys and girls, they are becoming more extremists, you know. So how we can deal with this matter, you know, that uh, burning Quran, what it gives, you know. So I was uh, so much happy and uh, proud of my prime minister, uh, Swedish prime minister, that when they asked to burn the Quran in Stockholm, he refused, he said no. But in the most of the Scandinavian countries, the governments they are allowing, and we are getting problems from the youth, Muslim youth. I think we have to understand, you know, um, what how hate speech operates, uh, and how how hatred, how hate speech can contribute to actual harms to people, including dignity-based harm as well. But that's one line. Yeah, of course, the other line, of course, is the need to respect uh, people's right to express themselves, even in offensive ways. Um, you know, the, the, there cannot be blasphemy laws that prevent people from speaking views that are offensive to be, uh, different religious uh, uh, communities. That way, like in Pakistan, they would suppress any dissent as well. But at the other extreme, when people use gratuitous, gratuitously offensive expression targeting communities, we know how the, what, what that does to people. So I think um, the answer lies not so much in criminalizing that because it only creates more of that, I think, but to have people speak out against that. When uh, a few years back in the United States, uh, a pastor called Terry Jones wanted to have a burn a Quran a day, I think he called it, the response of the US government wasn't to arrest him or to criminalize his activity, but to say that, you know, such actions were not part of, um, you know, civil discourse that, there was condemnation of such a, such a move, but there was no attempt made, uh, quite rightly, no attempt made to suppress his expression. So I think what people do with burning the Quran is to demonize Muslims, to perhaps hurt Muslims, or even try to marginalize them. And the way to respond that to that is not to arrest the person trying to burn the Quran, but to show solidarity with those communities which have been targeted. So as you can see with other forms of hatred, Hate, hate speech often tries to victimize those who are in a minority situation through xenophobia and all of that. And the, I think the response that should be show solidarity with those who are being targeted. If the Muslim youths felt that they weren't being, if you like, you know, um, disparaged, left, right, and uh, left, right, and center by everybody, maybe they'll feel less, uh, I think, um, motivated um, uh, to, to do something bad. At the same time, Faith-based actors like yourself, you know, if people from your community are uh, being, if you like, angered by this, it's also important that people like yourselves also tell these people how to respond. It is not to respond with violence. The response should be something else. So you should call for calm. You should call for a more, if you like, a more civil response. And unless we had faith-based actors also encouraging communities to be peaceful in how they respond to such uh, such incitement or su such hatred, we will not really have a you know, full answer to this. So I think at one extreme, we have to respect that people will speak offensively, at the same time understand that offensive speech will hurt people really, and therefore be prepared to support those communities with solidarity and, and if you like, uh, um, so solidarity and support for them in that fashion. Thank you very much. And Mr. Masroor Ahmad's answer was also this to all communities, you know, that we have to be very careful. We should not go out with the violence, you know. We should write in the in the newspaper, in the interviews, you know, that this is not good, but tolerance is the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just before uh, we finish, John Jonathan Wolf would like to give some remarks. You're you're on mute. There I'm, I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And thanks to Carlina and Yehuda and Bob and everyone. Dr. Shahid, I think you are a huge, vital hero and, and pioneer and, and, and 
are, are doing wonderful, wonderful work going back to the Maldives and everything you're doing at the UN. I would like you to be aware that I do a lot of work with many kinds of Jews of many denominations and many political views around North America, around Israel. Almost all of them despise the United Nations as a center of hate speech. I mean, the, the, the UN Commission on Human Rights was taken apart and then put back together. And it has such human rights heroes as Iran and Saudi Arabia and Russia and China serving on it. And 95% of its resolutions are condemning Israel. We peacenik, uh, pro-human rights, pro-cooperation with Palestinian Jews around North America and Israel condemn the current Israeli government and many, many things it does. But we believe that there's a legitimacy to Jews having a state and self-determination and independence. And we find that when the UN Commission on Human Rights spends almost all of its time talking about Israel and nothing about the horrible things that happen every day with Uyghurs and Tibetans and Turkey and Brazil and Venezuela and Burma, there's something very wrong. And there's what the something is basically an anti-Semitic or certainly anti-Zionist. I mean, after all, just a few decades ago, the General Assembly passed a resolution saying that Zionism, the self-determination independence movement of the Jewish people is racism and is an apartheid. And years later, they finally kind of reluctantly took that back. But I want you to know that what you're doing is important and vital and admirable, but that many, many Jews I work with think the UN is a hopeless place of hate speech against Jews. Yeah, thank you for raising it. I think it's a very important point you have raised. I fully agree with you that the UN has been um, very biased against Israel that some of its activities can be seen to be anti-Semitic and certainly it does sele it's selective in targeting Israel in ways uh, you know it doesn't do for any other country and and I find huge problems with this um, by the way I am as special reporter I am not I'm not a UN staff I am independent I am I work a pro bono for the UN um, so I have found issue with this um, in fact I have said the way when I began my work on the report on anti-Semitism. I began by saying that the way UN's approach this is, is, has been scandalous. Uh, because when I came to my current work, I found only one or two communications where UN was defending the rights of a Jewish person. Now they've got thousands of communications, right? And if you look at entire documentation, you just find a fraction of document, maybe 10, less than 10% of entire UN's documentation where there is an attempt made to support the rights of Jews anywhere in the world. So that is scandalous. And so I began to look at the issue and I, I recommended that all countries, including UN itself, adopt the IRA working definition, which has been contested by, by many sets, but I think it's absolutely spot on because all the modern manifestos of anti-Semitism are covered 